Good evening, Antwerp, and thanks for bringing your personal genome with you tonight. Um, basically, there's one thing which unites seven billion people on the planet. It's one meter of biological material which is so nicely condensed that it fits in every single cell of our body. And in the early 2000s, we managed to get a first glimpse on how it looked like. The biological code, our genome, contains three billion digits, which basically is 10 times more than in the entire Encyclopedia Britannica, which is 99% identical between all of us. In the essential parts, only 2% different from a chimpanzee, for some people it's less, but length, <laughs> length doesn't tell it all, because later on we learned that a potato has a genome which is three times longer. So we quickly learned that the basic thing which sits in this code is 1% of parts, building blocks which we call genes, which built our lungs, our eyes, our fingers. For 14,000 of these, we understand what they do. For 3,500, we understand that there is something wrong in their structure. We are born not complete, imperfect, if you like. The remaining 99%, we only found out the last eight years, I mean, during the last eight years. We start to understand that 99% of our code is instructions. We all know what it takes to make mayonnaise, I mean, eggs, oil, mustard, whatever, but getting it right is pretty complex. 99% of our code is the instructions, how to do it right. And I'll come back to that in a second. Now, it's been said already a few times. The first generation of this code, 2003, took 10 years, $3 billion. Now we can do it for a few thousand dollars. And in a few years' time from now, Access to your genetic code will be like access to tap water, electricity, CPU power. It will be essentially for free. So the question you have to ask yourself, what is it that we can do with it? And currently we get this code generated by a number of big academical and clinical labs spread all over the world, the biggest one in, in, in China. But a few months ago, the first tabletop sequencer was launched, kind of the size of a mixer. And the only European company which plays any role in this field has promised to announce a smartphone-sized sequencer second half of next year. That is what is going to happen. So what if we would have this code somewhere on a smart card? Would it be kind of the canary in the coal mine which takes our life and prevents or tells what will happen? Or is it too much expectations right now? So I would like to guide you to what it is what we can do, also explain what is still lacking and come up with two solutions, because it's very easy to see only problems. The biggest impact in having access to genomes is in our understanding of what cancer is as a genetic disease. We all know that smoking is bad, that smoking leads to lung cancer, but we all have someone in the family which never ever touched a cigarette but died from lung cancer. Since two months, we understand why. We understand it because we had a few thousand people with lung cancer, which were willing to provide their genome. And now we understand it's two completely different diseases. People dying from lung cancer because of smoke is something completely different than people never having touched a cigarette. The same for skin cancer. Some people invite themselves to get skin cancer. And nevertheless, some people die of skin cancer while never ever seeing a beam of sunlight. We understand why. It's two completely different diseases. So for that reason, we start to be able to get the patient into the clinic and not look to his body, but to look to his genetic code. And based on his genetic code, and sometimes one single digit, which is different between a patient and a health person, we start to be able to design personal cancer drugs. It's something which is feasible since 12 months. That's the biggest breakthrough we've ever seen in the big hype, the big hope that healthcare at some point in time would become personal. The very same technology now, we can also use to do something else. In this country, it's pretty much, much accepted that if you're pregnant, as a lady, that you go to see a doctor and that you get a Down syndrome test, which might tell that your baby uh, has too much chromosome 21. It's a pretty invasive procedure, it's risky. Now we can use one single drop of blood of a pregnant mother 
to identify the DNA of the unborn baby. So yes, we can tell down or not, but we can also tell whether one of these 3,500 diseases or gene errors I just mentioned are present in the unborn baby. So what if the mother of Stephen Hawking, Vincent van Gogh, Stevie Wonder, would have had this test? These are the kind of questions people start to ask. Can we handle our personal genome? And I'm going to put that in perspective. If you go to a doctor and you need an x-ray because your ribs are bruised, and the doctor sees all of a sudden there is a spot on your lungs and has to tell you that you have lung cancer, that's kind of what you call an incidental finding. If I would have access to your genome, all being adults, there is only 25 things which the genome tells me that will happen. It will not tell me when it's happening, but there's only 25 things you don't want to hear from your doctor. And against that background, we have seen kind of the generation of an industry of personal genomics. Companies which start to provide a possibility to take a little bit of um, 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 chic swap and look to 0.03% of your genome, just a tiny bit. Just to give you an idea, some people have more of their genome, a few people on the planet do have full access to their genome. How many people? Well, for every 3,000 Facebook users, you have one person with its personal genome sequenced. It's a tiny, tiny amount. Now, I did that myself, looking to my genome with the eyes of being in the field for something like 20 years. And it was very nice to see that I have the typical genes which tell me that I will not get bald. And I turned out to have genes which might indicate that I'm going to lose eyesight. But I had no clue why that would happen. And if I drink coffee past 4 p.m., I can't sleep for 48 hours. Nevertheless, I have the genes which metabolize my caffeine so quickly that I should be able to do that. When I looked to a bigger part of my genome, the problem got bigger. I should have been dead already. And it doesn't feel like that. I feel okay. I do have a number of mutations, but it doesn't feel like that. So what it is that we are missing? And what is it that we really can do with this code today? Well, I have to admit that this code, yes, that's fine, but the DNA tells you what can happen. The code makes three extra layers of information which tell when it will happen and how it will happen. And then on top, we have two layers of information which allow us to understand, all of a sudden, why it's not just this code which defines who we are, but it's what we eat, what we drink, how we deal with being amongst each other, which defines who we are. But we start to understand that these factors don't change the sequence, they interfere with, remember, the 99% of instructions from the past. So we start to see that the parts list is one, but getting the instructions right is important. And biology, or what makes a human being, is the combination of things. But we start to be able to measure what it is to be a human being based on our interaction with the outside world. One of the research teams I run then developed the first kind of approach, we believe, which is able to manage to combine all these different layers of information in one single analysis. And the sequencing machines, which I've shown you in the beginning, are the very same sequencing machines which I believe will start to be able to identify not just your code, which tell what can happen, but also to identify all the layers of information which tell when it will happen. And a few months ago, we have seen the first example of such a thing. One single patient, only one, the code said you might have or end up with diabetes, but since for 18 months, we measured every single level of biology and we saw it happening. The biggest impact was not just understanding disease, the biggest impact was all of a sudden to be able to do something. Because I can tell as well that if you get bees and you might have something like diabetes or cancer, please exercise, eat, whatever, healthy, uh, all these things you know yourself. But if nothing changes, which I can act upon, if nothing changes upon my exercise, upon my eating well, I start to tend to forget these things very quickly. Now, I start to have the tools which can measure on the fly how my code behaves and how it interferes with all the extra parameters. And you've heard um, the talk of um, um, Dr. Van Hove earlier. I think we will even start to see the combination of the biological information we harbor with these kind of uh, tricorder-like devices and, and wearable sensors pretty soon. 
The second question I would like to ask, combining things is not enough. The second question we have to ask is, why is it so that people would deal differently with their personal genome than with their social profile? And what if we would be able to combine a number of these things into each other? It's a question we try to start answering. And we start to see that patients or people are pretty willing to share a lot if there is a need, if they're sick. If they want to find the right medication, understand why they're sick, it's amazing to see how they, much they combine on websites like Patients Like Me, Cure Together, Triato. So is it so hard to believe that while a number of genetic findings have been made on just tiny populations, that we start to confirm this by looking to larger number of patient sets, or patients, but people like us, customers, if you like. So that we start to understand that the genome is not only making us sick, but that big part of the genome is there to keep us healthy and to maintain us our health. And one of the big investments we now start to do is using the genomic code to um, uh, look into people which turned out very healthy for the entire life to find out whether there is something in their code which might make them that healthy. And the reason why um, I think that there is some obstruction to do this is that there is not an incentive. People don't understand what they can get back from this. But isn't it unethical? If I would go to a pharmacist with a headache and he just gave me a box of pain stillers, while well, two letters in my code would be able to tell whether I'm with helped with aspirin and not with paracetamol or vice versa. So you start to see a number of incentives to help you exploring your genome and helping us to start extracting information out of it. Because what it would be, how nice it would be, if it's not just if you have a problem that you want to share. I never heard my cancer patients asking, well, what about my privacy? Never, ever. But that you're willing to start using and exploring your genome as well for the benefit of all of us. In that background, I would like to end with two, two uh, tiny thoughts. 15 years ago, a company called Yahoo had a discussion. Do we have to build a search engine? And unanimously, it was said not to do it because there's only 4,000 websites you can find. That's biology today. There's only a few thousand things we can find in our genome. But I believe that if we start to combine and to share this in a well-educated manner, that we will be able to do what Google did for healthcare by the combined use of our codes. And we work on the first number of applications to help you deal with your genome to be launched next year. I do thank you.